So anyway, I said, well, we're talking about healing. Why don't you let me pray with you? No, no, I'm not into all that, no. And I said, well, I am. I said, let me pray with you. So I simply reached up and just touched her head. And I said, Jesus, would you please take this migraine headache away so she can do what she's called to do? In Jesus' name, amen. And I just turned and walked back to my spot and she looked and she went, it's gone. And I said, it is? And she said, yeah. And I said, you're surprised? We ju we're talking about God healing rheumatoid arthritis, you know, twisted joints and all this, and it's medically verified now. Do you think a migraine headache is too big for him? And she was, she was kind of spooked by it. You know, she's there to do the interview. But so I think, uh, sadly, we're surprised. <laughs>
uh, just I was encouraged by the story. So she was just like, keep praying for your friend. Yeah. So then a week later, um, I'm at I'm talking to another friend. This is an African American woman, non denominational. She and she struggles with sickness. So I'm like, well, how do you navigate that? What's helped you? And she's coming out. She was like, there's this book on healing by Francis McNutt. I was like, twice. twice in a week span. I was like, maybe God is saying something here. Yeah. So I went and picked up the book and was reading it for my friend, like to, it's an encouragement to how to pray for her. And it really radically changed my prayer life. And so this is the book, you guys, Healing uh, by Francis McNutt. Yeah. And so uh, that's how we got here. So then I started, I read the book, radically changed my prayer life. Like me and my friends started praying together. One of my friends had HIV. Mm. We were praying for him. I, well, we, pray, we were praying one night um, and I just felt led of the Lord to pray for him. Mm. Um, and I usually think like, I've never seen someone healed from something like that. So I was like, praying for him for HIV just seems like a big, a big request. That's a big start. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And then the next week he was like, Lisa, you won't believe this for the first time I'm undetectable. And so they do have medicine to like get you to undetectable status. Yeah. But he had had this for 10 years and could never get to undetectable status. And so yeah. this was the first time he was like, it had to be God That's because I've been taking medicine trying to get to this status yeah. and I was never able to. And so that encouraged my faith. I would think so. Yeah. Um, and so I've just been praying with friends ever since. And we've just been seeing God answer prayers. And so this book has been really transformative to my prayer life, how I think about ministry, what I think Jude 3 will look like going forward. And so um, I looked up your husband and uh, I saw that he he passed away just a few a few years ago. Yeah. And then I started looking you up and then fell in love with your lectures on inner healing because you're also a, a therapist. Yes. And so I like the way you marry the therapy and the um, spiritual component into it. And so I was like, I have to get her on the podcast. And for a year I've been trying and we finally landed you on here. And then when Galen got you, I told Lance, we have to do an in-person interview. I want this uh, captured in this way. So, um, I'm excited. That's the story of how Judith got here. So just talk about like your journey into healing prayer and what the difference you've seen it make. Well, it's, a, it's just phenomenal the difference that it makes. But yeah, my journey, I grew up in a home in Eastern Kentucky mm -hmm. with a Southern Baptist mother and a father that went to church twice a year, I think and who later in life, when he was healed in cancer, really gave his life to God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I prayed for him. And was it that in the book too? Was that in the book? Or I read something about Francis, pray for your father? Yeah, he did. Okay. He prayed and he was healed of cancer. But I grew up in this home where I always witnessed my mother praying with people. Like she was just always praying with people. And I would come in as a little girl and, and people are sitting in the dining room crying you know, and talking to her. And I said, why do people come here and, you know, cry? And she said, oh, they just need Jesus. I'll never forget her line. They just need Jesus. She didn't call it inner healing or anything, but that's basically what she was doing. And she prayed for people who were healed of cancer and all kinds of different problems. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had that model growing up and I went to church all the time. But then when, when I went to college and kind of got away and I realized that uh, this, had, this doesn't happen everywhere. You know, the church doesn't even talk about it. Like mm -hmm. they'll put something in the bulletin if someone is sick or they'll put it online now and say, pray for so-and-so, she's in the hospital. But nobody, I don't know, did they pray? And if you just say, Lord bless that person, well, he's already blessed all of us, mm -hmm. you know, so they need healing and why do they need healing? and what do we need to do? So I started really uh, researching it mm -hmm. a lot more, talking to more people like you, reading books and listening. And the Lord really directed me as a young psychologist to start praying for my patients, mm -hmm. like in the hospital. 
and which landed me in some trouble because they don't want prayer in the hospital either. Mm -hmm. So it's like I wasn't finding it in the church mm -hmm. and I wasn't finding it in my profession. Mm -hmm. So that's when I moved to Israel and opened a house of prayer and started praying with everyone. And then that's when I found that book. Francis came to Israel to lecture mm -hmm. and we got one copy of that book and we had the Bible in one hand and healing in the other hand. And that's how we started praying with people. Mm -hmm. And we just saw all kinds of things. I mean, every physical, inner deliverance, everything take place. Yeah. So it was an exciting time. Yeah. So you're in a very exciting place yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. And, and one of the reasons this book appeals to me, and we were talking before we started recording, um, is because I have so many people that I'm interacting with yes. yeah. that need, it, particularly the inner healing, because you talk yeah. a lot about that. Um, yes. They're struggling and I've recommended therapy and for some they've got actually worse. Yeah. And I'm like, God, I don't think you want people to live like this, no. Um, no. that there's an abundant life um, that is joy, peace, and so if therapy isn't helping, what is going to help? You know, what is going to help? That's right. Yeah. And I was like, it, there has to be more. And so I remember just leaning into that, praying into that, what does that look like? And so for when I heard you talk about the inner healing yeah. and then also praying for memories, yes, I thought that was very, very uh, insightful. Can you talk a little bit about healing and why that sometimes therapy doesn't necessarily meet that and you're a therapist so I feel like you're uh, you can you can speak to this well well you know the, the interesting thing a lot of it goes back to uh, what I believe the Lord spoke to me one time and told me that we all have if we've had trauma or a lack of love especially lack of love in our lives then there's uh, what I felt like the Lord said is a shattered will mm. and we're taught all of us especially Americans but all of us to kind of pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and if you want it badly enough, you can have it and all that. And people, uh, we know that people, like if you take the whole world of addictions, like no alcoholic wants to drink and ruin their life, you know? And they have, they have in their mind that they want to get better, but their will, they can't do it. Mm -hmm. It's like somebody trying to lose weight, you know? You'll go three or four days and then just go, oh, I could just reward myself now. You know, what is that in us? And one of the things we, we talk about in inner healing is what we call capacity. People don't have the capacity to do what they need to do to get well. And so that if that capacity isn't built in childhood, like to, by two very loving parents and a loving community and a church and all that, then we don't, the, the will is not there. It's not strong enough. Mm -hmm. And so we keep failing over and over and over. We think things will make us happy, you know, get a new car, get a new boyfriend, you, you, whatever. And those things last for about a day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, then, and then we're right back in that, you know, depression is so prevalent in America right now, especially. You know, so if we have these memories that need to be healed, those memories don't go away. Mm -hmm. They're just with us always. Uh, say a father who's abusive or incest or uh, beatings or just even a lack of love, mm -hmm. you know, sexual abuse. Like one out of three women and one out of five men have been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. Although I think that number should be changed to like one out of one and one out of three because so many people I talk to have been sexually abused in childhood. Mm -hmm. You know, so those memories don't go away. Like if you have a positive memory that builds you up and gives you capacity and helps you be strong, mm -hmm. but these other memories literally weaken us. They weaken, weaken our will, our resolve, our motivation. And so what the Lord does is, because He's not bound by time or place, He comes into the memory. I, I always say he's like kind of a helicopter. You know, he sees from the beginning to the end of our lives and he can go in any space he wants to. 
I, as a therapist, can't. Mm -hmm. I can't reach back in someone's childhood mm -hmm. and change it. Mm -hmm. But he can. He can come. He can heal. He can protect that little girl or that little boy in that right. memory. And he can re kind of restructure it to be positive for them. Mm -hmm. You know, so healing of memories is very important. Mm -hmm. For those who are wrestling with those memories, because I think especially sexual violence in childhood is yes. so pervasive. Yes. And many yes. of the people that I know are, that are deeply wrestling in adulthood yes. is because they suffered some kind of sexual violence in childhood. Oh, absolutely. Um, what does it look like to pray? What does a prayer look like for a memory? Yeah, like, like if you came to see me, let's just, I'll use you since you don't look like you need too much healing, but, <laughs> but anyway, Say, say you uh, were in, incested by someone in your family, you know, like 70% of all sexual abuse happens with a family member mm -hmm. or s extended family anyway. You know, so if that happened and you came and you said this happened in my life or my neighbor abused me or my girlfriend's father abused me, you know, there's all kinds of ways that sexual abuse happens to children then I would say, hear your story. Mm -hmm. We teach our prayer ministers to three things, listen, love, and pray. Mm -hmm. They listen to this story. They're listening with one ear to God mm -hmm. while they're hearing the story and another one to the person. So basically they hear the story. I believe about 70% of healing takes place. Being eye to eye to someone, sharing the secrets of our soul mm -hmm and then praying with them. And you're loving them with the love of God. Mm -hmm. So you, you just simply ask Jesus to go back into that memory. Okay, because that memory is very present to the person, mm -hmm. very present. They don't have to look for it. Mm -hmm. We all know what our trauma, the traumas are. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just, yeah, ask Jesus, you know, to be in that memory, to come into the bedroom, you know, to be between that person and the person who offended them or hurt them to protect this child, to let that child feel safe. We, we will say sometimes, can you let Jesus hold you? Mm -hmm. You know, or God the Father hold you like a daddy would. You know, this daddy made a mistake. Can you have a perfect father in heaven? You know, and what is he saying to you? Mm -hmm. Listen to what he's saying, because he always talks. Mm -hmm. He always speaks to them. And he'll say something you're, like, you're my beloved child. I'm so sorry this happened to you. You know, I'm with you now. And they just start to, it's not like Jesus erases the memory, he kind of reframes it. And now when they think about it, and of course there's forgiveness involved always, mm -hmm. but when he reframes it, we can think about it without it crippling us. Mm -hmm. Because most memories are crippling mm -hmm. instead of strengthening, mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's, that's super helpful. One of the things um, I was thinking about in the book that Francis talks about was the power of forgiveness. And I think it was some sort, I don't know if I listened to it, I read in the book about a woman that was, had an ailment, but it was really tied to her unforgiveness. And when she forgave, it was like almost the sickness that she was feeling physically was erased. And so the connection between the inner healing and the physical healing, now this is not saying that all physical healing right. is a manifestation of inward trauma that's unprocessed, right. but there are some, I think science even bears that out. Oh, yeah. um, there are some physical ailments that are a manifestation of unprocessed yes. traumas. It is the, the to say like a, a book said, the body keeps score. Yes. Um, how should we, for some people who are grappling with forgiveness, it seems very difficult when you have those memories yes. to release the forgiveness. Yes. Uh, but it is the poison. I've heard somebody say poison, unforgiveness is po like drinking poison and uh, expecting the other person to die. Yes. Like how, do, how, how should we be processing that? Yeah. Well, you know, 70% of illness is either psychogenic or something in origin. You know, so when you start looking at it, that's rooted in the emotions. Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, the sayings, if we would just pay attention to our language, um, he makes me sick at my stomach. 
you know, you know how we'll say something like that? Mm -hmm. Well, then we start having stomach problems, you know, mm -hmm. or she's a pain in the neck, you know, or elsewhere in the body, depending on your language. But, mm -hmm. but we experiences in life, we somehow intuitively know that that's going to affect our health. The immune system is always affected by trauma. So it, it's in our best interest to forgive people mm -hmm. and to be healed and reconciled in some way. I don't mean you go back to a perpetrator, you know, if it's a dangerous situation. But I think, I think you know, the churches talk so much, and I, when I say church, I mean all the denominations. They've talked so much about forgiveness, but they don't tell us how to do it. Mm -hmm. I remember the church I grew up in, Oh my gosh, I repented of something every Sunday. You know, <laughs> as a little girl, I, I just would always repent. And because the preacher would be so strong, you know, on forgive and you're a sinner and all that. And I was like, I'm a little girl. I don't know if I sinned or not, but I'll repent, you know. What we need to, to get to, Lisa, is to rely on the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin, number one because many people think they've sinned and they haven't. I prayed with a man one time whose parents were going away on a vacation and the grandparents were gonna keep him and his two sisters. And he wanted to go with them. You know, he begged, don't leave me, don't leave me. And just as they were pulling the car out, he broke away from his grandmother and ran and, and got right up to the window and said, I hope you have an accident and die. Now he was like six years old and he came to see me when I was in private practice. He had arthritis throughout his body. You could hear him coming down the hall shuffling. He was just a miserable man. He was so, and he, he told me that story and I said, do you really think you killed your parents? And he said, I do. I cursed them. I said, you were six years old. And they did have an accident and died on that vacation, both of them. Wow. You know, so he felt, you know, kids feel they have so much power. <laughs> we all feel powerless as we get older, <laughs> which is funny. But anyway, we were, I was able to ask Jesus to come into that memory. He had to forgive himself. Mm -hmm. A lot of us have to forgive ourselves for the things we've done. So. I think it's really important for people to know, number one, was it a real sin? Or was it just a wound? Was it wounding trauma? Number two, is the Holy Spirit telling you? Because Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will come into the world to convict us of sin. You know, so we tend, the enemy, Satan, condemns us when we do something wrong. And so is the Holy Spirit really telling you? Obviously, if it's adultery or murder or something, that's a sin. But there's a lot of other things that aren't. If we've been raised in that culture of guilt or shame, we tend to just take too much on. So, and then the, the, the other part of that is to forgive someone takes grace. You never feel like forgiving anyone, mm -hmm. you know? And some people wait, well, when I feel like it, I will. But it's grace, so I, I help people understand. Let's ask Jesus who hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. I believe a grace entered the world at that moment in time that is just permeating the air we breathe even. I just think it's everywhere. Yeah. And all we have to do is say, Jesus, help me, forgive, and it comes instantly, yeah. you know, and then after forgiveness, the inner healing comes. You pray the inner healing prayer. I've always said, you know, for churches that are liturgical, like Catholic, Lutheran, Episcopal, and Anglican, all those, where they have confession, uh, you confess your sin, but then you need healing after that. So I've always tried to get inner healing into the confessionals mm -hmm. to get priests and clergy to know how to pray for them. So forgiveness is a gift. It's a gift, but it's also a gift we give ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. It's so, so funny you said that because I was uh, wrestling through 
my own forgiveness journey for, for something, uh, forgiving someone uh, in the recent months. Oh, yes. And um, <clears throat> the, recently the Lord took me to Jacob and Esau. And when Jacob is coming back and he's scared, he's scared yeah. to come back to, to Esau and he sends all these things like kind of to butter him up because he's yeah. thinking about what he's done to Esau and he has all this guilt Yes. and he's scared to return to Esau. And when he gets to Esau, Esau just embraces him I know. and he's like, I will take this. And he was like, I don't I don't want it. He ends up taking something just because he insisted. But I thought about like I was it was as if the Lord was like, put yourself in Esau's shoes for a minute. Mm. How long did he probably stew on his brother's uh, Ooh, yes. wound? Like how long oh, did he yes. stew on the fact that his brothers took his birthright? But at some yes. point, love, he allowed love to swallow. He did. The hurt. Yes. And so it was as if the Lord was saying, let love swallow the hurt that's great line. and can you be willing to embrace this person again yes if they return and be kind without making them jump through the hoops yes and yes. That's it, that's great. it was so convicting to me i could only weep like sure. because the pain was very palatable yes. so you feel the pain but you also have the tension of i love this person but uh -huh. also i have a deep wound but what does it mean to let love swallow the hurt? I love that line. Um, love swallow the hurt. I love that. And let forgiveness flow. And that, Good. when I said, Lord, I'll do that. If you yeah. bring this person back, I will let love swallow the hurt. And I felt a, a release in my own, because you don't know how much you're carrying when you have the for, unforgiveness in your heart. I know. I know. You know, I've always felt, being a therapist, I've always felt like, most people don't want to sin against us. You know, it's their own brokenness mm -hmm. that makes them act that way. So the older I get, I really think about that now when I'm working with someone. You know, that it sounds like that person, I remember a friend of mine who's a priest, he says, hurt people hurt people. And when we carry hurt within us, we want to place that hurt somewhere. And you know, the old thing of scapegoating or transferring or projecting, whatever we want to call it. Then we, we just, we hurt people, hurt people, hurt people. That's why it's so important to take care of our own heart, take care of our own journey. And then when things come that, I, I'm, I'm pretty quick to, I, I think every night, this is what I try to do. When I go to bed at night, I tell God what I'm grateful for that day and thank him. And then I bring to his attention, which he already knows about, <laughs> the things that hurt me that day or disappointed me. And I choose to forgive before I go to sleep because you won't sleep anyway. I always tell mm -hmm. people, you know. But yeah, most people, uh, they just don't think. They just don't think. They just say things. and. We're developing a culture in America that is kind of writing on history of being unkind to one another and to different groups and peoples and denominations and everything. You know, so we're kind of riding on those coattails and it's time to stop and begin to love each other uh, as Jesus told us to. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think love is the, the one of the ways we're gonna penetrate culture. Yes. Um, like even as I was using an example of what God was sharing with me, just been dealing with me on grace and love, that when you receive, understand my love and what I did on the cross, yes. then you're able to give that grace to someone else. But then yes. you feel, when you feel the weight of the offense, you feel what it took for God to release our sin. Like yes. you feel a fraction of it. Yes. So then that gives you a new experience with grace Yes. But then when you extend it to someone else, they get to see a human demonstration of the grace that God is trying to disperse unto them. So it's like God is always doing a two for one, yes, I'd say, in, yeah. in the conflict with people. Uh, he's trying to minister to the person that hurt you and minister to you at the same time. Yes. And so it is that demonstration of the grace we received yes. um, that frees us and the other, pe other people we're in relationship with. Absolutely. 
That's why in the book we talk about the four kinds of healing, mm -hmm. because the, there, there's four kinds. You know, I grew up, we used to have, since you've got a Pentecostal background, we had these tents that came through town. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother would take me to church in the morning, like to the Baptist church, which was very staid and very quiet. Then we'd go to a tent at night, you know, if they happened to be coming through town. And people were filled with the Spirit, and they were praying in tongues, and they were resting in the Spirit, and they were really happy and, you know, joyful and everything. And I was like, this is very different, you know, I would tell her. But anyway, I learned a lot early on about, you know, the whole move of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does. And the four kinds of healing, most people just think of healing as being physical. Mm -hmm. You know, because they've had Oral Roberts and Benny Hinn and all of Francis McDonald and all these people to pray for physical healing. Of course, that's important if you're hurting and sick or especially terminally. But then there's spiritual healing, which is what you're talking about, the love and the grace of God uh, and forgiveness. And then there's inner healing mm -hmm. of the emotions. And then there's deliverance from evil. So all four of those a lot of people that have been really traumatized need all four kinds. Mm -hmm. So we, we've trained our prayer ministers to really look, you know, what's, what's here? Some people just need good old physical healing, Francis used to call it. Just good old physical, they've had an accident or a car wreck and they just need that. But the majority of us need almost all of those. So, and that's what Jesus said, like Matthew 10, he said, you know, lay hands on the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you've received, freely give. So the church has only done a limited number of those things. Mm -hmm. And I feel really hopeful, especially as someone young and influential like you, begins to get that excitement about the different kinds of healing and how can we bring this to the church? How can we bring it to our communities, our families that are so falling apart now. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if more people understood it, there wouldn't be as many divorces. Just all the things that we see now in our culture. Yeah. Yeah. No, so I, you, you segue right into my next question, which yeah. is um, the, the deliverance from evil. Yeah. I think we discount the real reality of evil yeah. and that people have open themselves up to demonic influence, yes. whether that be a lot of things that are going on now that people are engaging with the occult yes. and demonic. Yes. And so something I was visiting a friend in Atlanta a few weeks ago and we were having, um, we were just talking and she was saying, um, she pointed me to the scripture about anger. Uh, and, and it takes yeah. a foothold in your life. Yeah. And like anger brings, can bring like, demonic strongholds in your in your life and I had never thought about it in that way but as I was thinking about just the different outside of people d diving into the occult I think bitterness brings demonic strongholds yes. uh, um, anger all of those things can bring and those take a different kind of prayer to be released from can you talk about that because I think a lot of people it's more than just forgiveness Sometimes it is, you know, need to forgive. But if you let stuff fester, you have different things that have, you know, yeah. circled around your life and created real strongholds that you need the power of the spirit to, to break. Absolutely. Yeah, stronghold's a good word for it. Uh, I had a, a man uh, who's an evangelist came to the house of prayer. I was running in Jerusalem. And he said that we're all tempted in every way of course, I use this in my teachings. We're all tempted in every way, but it also tells us in the Bible, the Lord prepares a way out. Mm -hmm. So look for that way out, I tell people, <laughs> you know, yes, that man looks good, but don't go there, you know. But then if we give in to temptation and we continue in that behavior, it becomes a habit. And then over time, if we stay in that habit, it becomes a stronghold and that's where the enemy can come in so that can be with occult activity, that can be with hatred, that can be with racism, that can be with sexism, that can be with greed, which is one of our number one ones in America right now. 
You know, uh, extreme emotions, mm -hmm. extreme fear can open the door to the enemy, uh, extreme anger, grief that goes on too long. Uh, all of those things, there's like a counterfeit in the enemy's world of our emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, now, not joy and love, obviously, but the so-called negative ones. I don't like to call them negative. But anyway, the, 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 once that door is open, like the scripture you referred to, be angry but sin not, that's saying you're going to be tempted. Uh, it also gives you a time frame. Don't let the sun go down on your anger so you're dealing with it like I do at bedtime. Or you'll give the de devil a, a foothold. So that means he's in now. He's not just around you, he's in, you know. And there's a big debate in the church for so many years, can a Christian have a demon and all that? Well, I believe they can, because um, I've done this for 45 years. So anyway, I think the occult is the number one reason most people get into demonic. Uh, we don't call it possession because that's too strong. That's somebody who's really given their life over. They've made blood covenants with Satan and all kinds of things. Belong to covens and cults and warlocks. That, that's a whole different story. Uh, when Jesus talked about having a demon or a Paul, it was simply that, to have one. Derek Prince, I like the way he described it. He said, it's like a, a, when we first come to the Lord, the, Jesus and the Holy Spirit and to move into Main Street and then they get into Cherry and Maple and on down Oak Street. And then, uh, but there's still an area that we don't let them in. And that's where, as uh, Chuck Kraft would say, the rats are, you know. And he says, if you want to get rid of the rats, get rid of the garbage. So you get rid of the garbage, the rats leave. So what's the garbage? That's the demons, you know, or I mean, they're sin. And the rats, that's uh, the demons. So. I'll tell you, you know, I just finished doing a, a new revision, an expanded revision of Francis's book, Deliverance from Evil. And uh, so I've been immersed in this for about a year now. It'll be coming out in March, the new one. But when I was a little, uh, not a little girl, I was, uh, well, I was pretty small. I went to a slumber party and we were all good little Christian girls. But somebody said, let's do a seance. And I said, okay, what's that? <laughs> you know, I didn't know what it was. So we got in a circle and lit a candle and we called on one of them had a dead grandmother. We called on her. Something showed up. I can tell you, I heard a voice and we just scattered. We were like roaches when the lights are turned on. <laughs> we just took off under beds, in the shower, everywhere. Scared us, you know, and then in high school, one of my girlfriends had a Ouija board. I'd never heard of a Ouija board. So we cut class, went into a room, played with a Ouija board. Well, flash forward to Israel, this before I was married, and this man came from Pretoria, South Africa, who had a deliverance ministry, and he was a Baptist. My pastor got a hold of him, introduced me, he offered to pray with me, and I thought, well, that's sweet, you know. Well, we sat down to pray, and he looked at me. I mean, the Holy Spirit just revealed it. And he said, you've been involved in the old cult. And I said, no, I haven't. I've been a Christian my whole life. And he said, well, the Holy Spirit is saying that. And he said, let's, let's pray. I'd totally forgotten those experiences. And the moment he prayed, and I just sat there quietly, both of them came to my memory. Mm. And he said, I told him what they were, and he said, you were joking. You were playing, but the enemy took you serious. Mm. You walked into a, his territory. So with deliverance, what we have to do is acknowledge that we have sinned against God by seeking knowledge other than from him. And then we have to repent directly of it. And then we have to renounce it. I will no longer be involved in the occult, you know. And then I prefer to have someone else pray the prayer of authority to cut me free from that and tell it to go. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I just did this yesterday with one of my girlfriends that I'd spent the weekend with. And there was somebody in her life that the father is a warlock. Mm. And when I looked at this young woman, I saw that. I didn't know. And she said, well, you know her father's a warlock. And I said, no, I didn't know that. And that's like a satanic high priest. So we broke that and everything. That, that young girl was cut free that I had seen this in. You know, so people think that some of those things are just innocent, but they're really not. And they think they're games like tarot cards and horoscopes and all those. There's so many innocent ways people walk into that. But then people who do violent crimes and things, they really do open themselves or extreme anger, what we were talking about. But it's just another form of healing. And that's what we always want people to think about, to do it in the context of forgiveness and, and even healing. Because mm -hmm. some people are sick because of a demonic activity. Mm -hmm. you know, so I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, no, I, I think all of that is super important to think through and yeah. see where the gaps are. Because as, as we talked about before, I've sent a number of people to therapy and they either had no change or right. it actually was worse. And you and your statistics, you said before we started recording, a third of people get better, yes. a third of people have no change, and a third of people get worse. Yes, bad odds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it only works uh, one out of three. For one third of one the third people. of the population. And so yeah. I was like, and then there's a number of people who can't even afford it. Oh no. So I'm like, I, I'm, I'm like, there has to be something that's yes. available that God provides yes. that helps people walk in freedom yes. and liberty and have peace. And so I know we're not discounting there's sometimes chemical imbalance and people need medication. Oh, All of those factors are true, yeah. but I just, I feel in my heart that there is more that God wants to do yeah. for people to be healed, for people. And I, I, I just, yeah. from what I've seen this year after reading this book and implementing prayer on a whole new level, praying with friends, uh, praying intensely in my own, like this has probably been the most consistent in my walk with the Lord of prayer and being okay. intentional. And I've just seen breakthrough in the lives of friends. I've seen God answer yeah. prayers. And it's just simply by literally having prayer together, yeah. confessing in James passage, confess your faults one yeah. to another, pray for one another, yeah. and then healing comes. And so it's so basic, but we forget to do it. It's very simple. And, and well, we've not been taught, really. Mm -hmm. We've really not had it put together mm -hmm. in a very good package. Yeah. It's been a little disjointed in the church. Mm -hmm. and, and the Holy Spirit's bringing it back now. Yeah. You know, and I tell people it really is simple. I remember our schools of healing prayer. We, we, had like th we used to have like 13 talks per school, mm -hmm. four levels. And I was telling my dad about this one time, the schools. Mm -hmm. He said, what is it you do again? He can never remember what I did. <laughs> it was just so out of his framework. And I said, well, if we teach people how to pray. And he said, all of that to teach people how to pray? Isn't prayer simple? I said, well, yes, it is. But they learn a lot. You know, they just have to learn so much about how to pray. But I just encourage people all the time, just start praying. Just start praying, read a good book, you know, read the Bible. <laughs> just if your friend is, we were doing, uh, down in Tampa, I was doing an interview. We were doing a medical study on the healing of rheumatoid arthritis. And it was with a doctor out of Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And we had the, you know, the film crew and everything. And uh, we had, it's actually in medical journals now and we have a video of it and all that, but it, this, this one woman that came over, she was just a newscaster from Tampa. And she came over and she was interviewing me. And she, she just kept squinting and rubbing her head and everything. And finally she said, let's take a little, like a minute break or something. And I said, are you okay? And she said, I have, I have one of my migraines. You know, people always say, my migraine, my allergies. And I'm like, they're not yours. <laughs> So anyway, I said, well, we're talking about healing. Why don't you let me pray with you? No, no, I'm not into all that, no. And I said, well, I am. I said, let me pray with you. So I simply, 
reached up and just touched her head. And I said, Jesus, would you please take this migraine headache away so she can do what she's called to do? In Jesus' name, amen. And I just turned around and walked back to my spot and she looked and she went, it's gone. And I said, it is? And she said, yeah. And I said, you're surprised? We ju we're talking about God healing rheumatoid arthritis, you know, twisted joints and all this, and it's medically verified now. Do you think a migraine headache is too big for him? And she, she was, she was kind of spooked by it. You know, she's there to do the interview. But so I think, uh, sadly, we're surprised. Yeah, and I think you know, I was on the way to an event um, a month ago and a friend was driving and she picked up another friend and the friend was saying how she got this reading from um, some kind of, I don't like a, the person that does astrology, uh, yeah. psychic reading. Yeah. And she was talking about how accurate it was down to the fact that her bed was broken and uh -huh. the psychic was able to tell her everything and so much that happened in her life. And I had been reading through the book of Acts during this time. Yeah. And I thought to myself, for someone like that, what is it going to take for them to convert? And that it's, it said to me, they need to see a demonstration of the power of God that's greater God. than mm -hmm. the demonic things that they're seeing. Yeah. Because just a simple declaration of the gospel is not going to be effective. And, I, and not to say it can't be, because it can. I don't want to limit God. Yeah. But I, I thought about Paul and Acts and how the di apostles moved. Sometimes it was the a lot of the times it was the demonstration and wow. then the gospel presentation. Yes. And I, I said, we need that same like demonstration because if a psychic could tell her something yeah. about herself, she wants to see, well, does God have more power to see into my oh, life? Sure. And so just been really praying into that. Like, God, what does that look like? How are you, you're showing me these different things. How are you trying to use me um, in this season by what you're demonstrating? Um, to me through these encounters with yes. friends needing healing, with meeting people that are in, you know, these things like, and then meeting people constantly that need inner healing that have really intense mm -hmm. traumatic experiences. Yes. Like, I feel like these pieces, what, what, how are you putting them all together for me in this season? Yes. And so for, when you're saying that, it's just really resonating with me. Um, because I just feel like I sense yeah. that God is going to use me in a different way. But also I feel like just as the body of Christ as a whole in this yeah. season, God is going to use us in a different way. And that's why I wanted this conversation yeah. uh, to happen because I mean, the way that this, I even got introduced to this book is providential. It is providential, <laughs> um, of course. And just all the things that have been happening in my life this year are no coincidence. Oh, no, not and at so, all. And uh, so I'm excited to have you here to talk about this. And I would love for you, uh, we're about to wrap it up. Um, is there anything you think our audience should know or that you feel like pressing upon your heart that the Lord is pressing upon your heart in this moment for our audience or for me or for Jude 3 that you, you, you wanna share? Well, I know I, I looked at your ministry and I was so impressed, you know, with what, what you're trying to accomplish in the world. And I, I, had, I would like to bring it back to the love of God, you know, that your audience would truly begin to understand that love really, really is the signature that God, you know, we say kind of casually, God is love, but it's the love that heals and he designed us to be in relationship with him. It, it, we're designed. Mm -hmm. And we're designed to be in love and in relationship with one another. And Jesus was the model for that. And look how Paul's life was changed, you know, from Saul to Paul. You know, we're meant to, to love one another. And it was interesting this morning when I woke up, I was praying about today, and he just said, the Holy Spirit is the one that puts the love, like Romans 5, 5, says the love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And we're told to love one another, but if going back to capacity, these were the three things I've jotted down. Capacity, if you don't have capacity, you can't love. Mm -hmm. And you have to love yourself. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So all love starts with him, and you have to know you're loved, and I would want your audience to know each and every one how much they're loved, and, and to begin that self-love journey so they can build that capacity with him and then begin to love other people. And then in Corinthians, it talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and, and that whole 1 Corinthians 13 is on love. It's just on love. And so uh, there was one great say to the church that he said, when you stand before God, God will have one question for you. How much did you love? And what are you going to say? You know, you look at the life of Mother Teresa and people like that. You can be that way. You can be that way. I can be that way. It's a high bar. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can do that. And then all this healing flows out of that. Like people that come to Christian Healing Ministries don't ever want to leave. They come for a school or they come for an intensive prayer time. And they say, can we just stay? Because we have a staff that really loves. They really love. They're not judgmental or anything. They've learned to love themselves and love God. And then out of that, you learn to do the prayer. So it's like we're, you're already a very loving person. Uh, I can see that in your eyes. And so God is taking you to a new level now to let that love go in power, because love is power. And I believe at the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and those flames of fire on their head, I believe that was love being poured out on them. And I had a baptism of love in the garden tomb in Israel. The Lord just lifted me and filled me with his love. And he told me first how much he loved me. And that changed my whole trajectory when I knew I was that loved. So I think to ask every day for the Lord to fill your heart, that Romans 5, 5 prayer, with his love. And that my husband had the gift of love. That's what you read all through this book. You know, he loved. He just had such a great gift. He had a great gift of healing, but he had a gift of love. And everyone felt loved in his presence, everyone. So that's, that's kind of a good way to say, Lord, I, I want to be that kind of a person. I want to be the way you created me to be, to move in power, to move in authority, which we have as Christians, but to always undergird everything with your love. That's awesome. That is so, so helpful. And I encourage y'all to get this book, Healing, and Judith, would you, we, we haven't done this ever close out, but would you pray for our audience that are listening, that are might be in need of inner healing or physical Absolutely. healing, have demonic strongholds yes. and want freedom? Can you just pray for them and that'll sure. close us out? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would, ask, I would ask you as an audience, if you need that prayer, to just put your hand over your heart. Uh, because it, the heart really is the seat of everything within us. It's not our wonderful brain. It's our heart. So, Lord, we just uh, thank you so much for this time together. I thank you for Lisa. I thank you for her ministry, for all the ways she's discovering new levels of ways to love you and love people and herself. So together, Lord, we just turn this prayer over to you for everyone listening. Holy Spirit, we pray that Romans 5, 5 prayer for each person, that your love, the love of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit would come and just fill your heart today, that you would just fill those flames of fire within your own body, within your own being, that the love of God would go into every place in your memories. Just every place, all the way back to when you were conceived in your mother's womb. And I know some of you have felt like maybe you're a mistake or the wrong sex or the wrong race or the wrong socioeconomic level. But you know, the Lord knows you. He knows your heart. He knows your hurts. He knows the strongholds, the addictions in your life. So Lord, we just pray now that you will reveal your deep heart of love and your ability to heal and restore each person listening. 
And Lord, I pray that you'll bring people into their lives that will show them your love. And I pray that as that happens, you'll just knit their hearts together and let them find that loving community that's a family, perhaps, that they never had. But mostly, Lord, just flood them this day with your healing power and with your love, Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much Judith. Thank I you. appreciate it. Thank you all for watching. This has been another episode yes. of the Jude 3 Project podcast, a special episode. You can check out all our past episodes at Jude3project.org. You can become a monthly partner or donate at Jude3project.org backslash donate, or there's an option to give online. Thank you so much. Um, I know we've been lacking on episodes, uh, but it's just been crazy, crazy busy, but we have uh, new content on the way. And I just hope that this episode is transformative for you. It blessed me and I know it will bless you. Until next time, grace and peace and God bless.